superintendent for Anchor Bay School Board. Um, if we could rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, and um, Mr. Green, if you could call the roll for us tonight. Very good, Ms. Berkmeyer. I'm here. Mr. Moses. He is excused. Uh, Mr. Green is present. Ms. Knox. Here. Mr. Richards. Here. Mr. Drew. Here. And Mr. Middlestat. He is also excused. You have a quorum, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, um, so on behalf of Anchor Bay School District, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Philip Jankowski to this interview of the position of superintendent. Mr. Jankowski is currently the assistant superintendent for Armada, our area schools. Just to review our format, um, our interviews may take up to 90 minutes. There will be 24 questions from the board. Toward the end of the interview, time permitting, we will give the candidate an opportunity to ask questions of the board and make a closing statement. And we will let you know if time is becoming an issue and there's a need to pick up the pace of response. As the board hears from each candidate and weighs this critical decision, it will be doing so through the lens of the candidate profile that was developed with considerable input from our stakeholders. Our intent is to identify the candidate that best fits this profile, which board members have at hand. Audience feedback may be submitted by those present on the form located at the table of the entrance of the auditorium. Those participating virtually may provide feedback electronically by way of the link provided for this purpose. Although the task of choosing our next superintendent is the responsibility of the Board of Education as the elected representatives of our community, we value and consider the input of our stakeholders in this process. So welcome, Mr. Jankowski. Thank you. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So Mr. Jankowski, while we have had the opportunity to review your application materials, audience members here and those viewing at home have not. Please briefly review your background and share what causes you to be interested in this position at this point in your career. Okay, thank you. I've been in education 25 years now and I began my education at the south end of the county at um, Warren Fitzgerald. Started teaching there and I taught English computer science, video production, stagecraft, science, pretty much anything that they ask and taught that for seven years. Over that time, I also served as um, coach three sports, yearbook advisor, school improvement chair, and really got a love for all of education and really had a good experience of helping kids and watching them grow. And as part of that, I was honored to be named um, their teacher of the year for um, Warren Fitzgerald, and then went on to the county level where I was honored to be named Macomb County High School Teacher of the Year in 2004. At that point, I was promoted to assistant principal. The district had done a buyout of all of the administrators, so moved up to the assistant principal position. And that was just an excellent opportunity where even as assistant principal, but with one of the few remaining administrators that had um, institutional memory, I was given a lot of responsibility. I did secondary curriculum, negotiated contracts, worked with our budgeting and worked for um, our bond issues. And we had a successful $63 million bond where we built a new elementary school um, as part of the video production class that I had and those skills. Then I also helped other districts at that time with bond issues. Van Dyke was one of them where I worked with them in order to help promote their bond, successful bond issue. And then at that point, after four years, my wife and I, my wonderful wife of 25 years, Kelly, who was out in the audience, she and I had purchased land out in Armada and we were planning, we knew we, were, we wanted to move out that way. We wanted to make sure I've always felt that my 
own children. I have a daughter who's graduating from Oakland University this year, and I have a son who's graduating from Armada, that they should attend whatever district that I'm working at. So they were at Fitzgerald. We wanted to move out to Armada. At that point in time, Armada happened to have a um, principal opening. So applied for that. We put our house up for sale as well on the same day, applied for my degree program at Oakland University, and hoping one of those three, if they go well, life will be good. Sold our house the next day. This was right before the, the um, crash in 2008. Then got the principal job at Armada and got accepted to the program in Oakland University. From there, I came into Armada. I was following, they had five principals in the previous four years. They had been doing the, they'd retire, rehire. And it was tough with the staff because things changed. There was no stability and they didn't necessarily get along with the, the most recent um, administrator that I was replacing. And we just had a tremendous amount of success. I was high school principal and secondary curriculum director. We worked on realigning the curriculum, updating textbooks. Many of our textbooks at that point were 30 years old. So we worked through a whole process of bringing everything up to, to where they would be published within three years. We expanded our advanced placement programs. We had two at that point. We expanded it to 11. Worked on writing grants, doing whatever, because we, being a, a, a district that's the lowest funded, and we knew there was a challenge and there was resources. So we worked on whatever we could, did whatever we could to, to kind of provide the teachers whatever they need. So at that point, we didn't have the LCD projectors in the classroom. Worked on that, wrote grants, had a parent who said, I'll run the electrical if you want to install them. I installed the video portions of that. We were able to do that. Started with some grants. We were able to provide teachers with that experience. Then from there, our scores were, were just moving up. We were, when I arrived, we were towards the bottom of the county in dropout rate. We had just shy of a 30% dropout rate at that point. And our scores were not really all that, um, Good in comparison to everything else. On the out of the 21 districts, we're we're about the middle of the county. So we worked through the curriculum, worked through some um, different things, and by my um, sixth year, we were towards the top of the county. And I was honored to be um, nominated by some parents and students and, and teachers to be um, Michigan's high school principal of the year. And I won that honor in 2013. And from there, it was a whirlwind in working with the governor's office, working with um, different local legislators in order to try and improve not only education in the district, but for the state. Was asked to present at several different um, places, presented for the US Department of Education on teacher evaluation, which was the big issue at that point in time. We had an innovative teacher evaluation system. So then we were asked to present that. And from there, moved up to the assistant superintendent where I've been for the last seven years. And been in charge of curriculum, human resources, negotiations, budget, some technology, um, pretty much as they say, other duties as assigned. And from there, we've just had tremendous success working with the teachers, trying to align things trying to make sure that our district, our concept has been one Armada, getting everybody to work in the same direction. And based off of that, our scores have been tremendous. We're proud to say that over the last five years, we've had the highest index rating in the county of any um, high school. An overall index rating, we're, we're always right there. It's Anchor Bay and Armada going back and forth. And we've just had a tremendous amount of success. And so based off of that, when you win awards like the teacher of the year or principal of the year, you, and you see things, you wanna make sure that your impact, you have this desire where you wanna make sure that, it's sort of like imposter syndrome where, where you're really, they, they nominated me for that and you wanna live up to their expectations. And I feel I've done that. And I feel that now, 
as my son and daughter are both graduating, would be an excellent opportunity to look for that next step. And that's why I'm here tonight. Thank you. I'm just going to back myself up just a second because I realized I didn't introduce the board to you. Okay. No problem. <laughs> um, I had speak program with you. I'm Lisa Bergmeyer. This is Mr. Patrick Green, uh, Mr. John Daru, Mr. Dennis Richards, and Ms. Jill Knox. We have two members uh, who couldn't be here tonight, Mr. Mike Moses and Steve mm -hmm. Middlestaff. Um, given your research on our district, what do you believe are the two or three most critical challenges that our district will need to address? And how would your background and skills help us address these challenges? I would say looking through all of the data that you've had, um, first thing that, that jumps out will, would be enrollment. I know enrollment has um, declined somewhat. I noticed that just looking through one thing that we've looked at and we're, we always keep an eye on it in our meta and I think is a, a good thing is to look at what is your um, balance in students lost versus schools of choice versus students brought in. I noticed you lost about 200 students for um, Merritt Academy, 37 to um, an online program. I know Redford Union's running and that's significant. The threshold that I've always used in our district is if we have more than 10 students going back and forth, then I want to know, I want to be positive against any of those districts, because occasionally you'll always have a district where they have a teacher that lives in your district, works in the other district, and so you might see two or three, and I'm proud that we've been, we're net positive against every single district on ours, and I think that's first and foremost, because funding is tied to students. Opportunities are also tied to the number of students you have, can you run certain programs and so on, so that, that would be one thing. Two, I would say student achievement has been pretty good. Um, it, the name of the game is changing in, in the state. It is going from proficiency to growth. And if you're not looking at that, it's, it's the largest part of the student, of the school rating system and the district rating system. It was impressive to see, again, they, there's something, I don't know if you're familiar with student growth percentiles, but that's the new rating system. And that's what a lot of it is based off of. And most of your buildings do very well. They're all, you're either 50th percentile. And if you're above, that means you're growing and getting better. And if you're below 50th percentile, that means those students are not keeping pace with growth in almost every area, except for one, um, that was your economically disadvantaged students for English you were above 50th percentile and you had one of the best growth scores in the county. And I think that's another concern is just making sure those subgroups and making sure student growth throughout the entire um, level. The, the last thing I would say, just knowing we're so closely um, aligned kind of demographically, geographically, and we have so many, there's teachers and spouses that work in both districts and, and everybody, you know, when you, you agree to one of these interviews, everybody's coming and saying, hey, this is what I know that need. I know that culture is a huge thing and that people need to believe that they are supported and they need to believe that they are treated as professionals. And I think that is probably the, the most important thing overall is to make sure that teachers and staff members and everybody is respected and supported doesn't mean that you always give in to what they're doing. It means that you just make sure that the, you disagreements are about the important things. It could be about learning, it could be about grading, it could be things like that. But everything else, you make sure that you provide whatever teachers need. And if, if you can't do it today, then you work towards it. What are the immediate challenges you would expect to face and given these, tell us how you would hit the ground running July 1st and ensure that we are fully prepared for a positive, productive school year. I would, I would, I would argue that you can't wait till July 1st in that situation. Many students are going to be out. Um, if I was lucky enough to get the position, it, it would have to start right away. It would meet with every single um, administrator, at the building level, at central office, um, meet with teachers as much as possible. I know end of the year is tough time, they're doing things. So you wanna make sure that you're 
understanding all of that before you go in um, and make sure that they know where you're at. Give everybody my phone number. I mean, that's how it is now. Um, I like to think that um, I go the extra mile for teachers and a lot of them will tell you that it doesn't matter if you can text me at night, you can email me, I will respond. And I would let them know because you want to get input as much as possible. Because if you wait until July 1st or school starts, then again, people get caught up in, in the hectic pace of opening school. And that's when you want to make sure you have things in place, for whatever they need, especially in this era of COVID. Good evening, Mr. Jankowski. As uh, Ms. Berkmeyer mentioned, my name is Patrick Green. I'm the Vice President of the Board. Uh, and I have a couple of questions for you now, and then I have a couple that I'll circle back to okay. uh, after everyone else. That uh, first question, maintaining healthy relationships with school and community stakeholders is important to us as a board. Mm -hmm. Please share with us how you have gone about building and maintaining successful relationships with members of your current school community. I think it's important, especially if, if you live in a community that's out here in Northern Macomb County, where the school is the heart of the community. They wanna see you at events, they wanna see you around, they wanna make sure you're approachable. I am constantly, I'm the, that's one of the hard challenges here because I'm the voice of Armada. I announce all of our sporting events and so on. So I, part of it with the microphone, I wanna <laughs> go into my announcer voice. And you make sure that people are there. When I attend events, I make sure I sit in the same spot because I want people to know that where I'm at. And typically they do. I've had people that, you know, have approached me at my home and all that just to ask questions about school and make sure that you respond to people within 24 hours. Make sure that you listen to them. Make sure that, again, that you are providing whatever support that you can for those people and they know, um, again, it's, it's one of those things where people know if you're genuine, people know if you're out there to do what's best for um, the students in the community. It's whether it's volunteering at the pancake fundraiser at the, for the firefighters or whether it's, um, we do a great event with our seniors. It's a senior camp out that I started where it's all of the, it's our township supervisor, it's the chief of police, it's the chief of the fire that are there, they're cooking for the kids and then just making sure that it's a community event and that everybody's there because the kids are the most important thing and bringing them involved, getting businesses involved, getting people supported. We launched a um, renewable energy program and it was one of those things where we worked through the state, we got it approved and we needed the equipment and we'd go to community meetings and we'd just talk about it. And then we were lucky enough to have one of our community members who said, hey, I happen to be vice president of the special projects engineering and I'll help you out. It's those connections that when you get those going that it just feeds upon itself and everybody wants to pitch in because it builds that momentum, it builds that camaraderie and that those lines of communication. Okay, thank you. Uh, what are some examples, and you already mentioned some of them, but what are some additional examples you might be able to give us of community activities in which you've provided leadership and how did those benefit your district? It, again, in Armada, we are the it, heart of the community. So everything that we do, it's whether it's the Memorial Day Parade that starts at our schools, um, homecoming parade is, is the largest thing that we do. Um, the entire community is there. And just from all of the different events that we have, all of the different, the open houses that we offer, the hosting um, it, twice in my time there, we, we've had the unfortunate situation where students have passed untimely and we've hosted funerals for those students because the, the community needs a place of mourning. And so you, you provide that for people because that's what they're, you want to make sure that you're just connected to the community like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, how do you 
how do we create a district-wide culture of continuous improvement to achieve strategic outcomes? I, th I think first you have to, to set, um, I like to call it, it's kind of the leading like academic indicators. So you have to define success first. So my thought would be first meet with each board member and, and get their individual definition of that. Talk to the teachers and the community, whether it's a full blown strategic planning or something like that. So you get that definition. We did that at Armada and I led the strategic planning process and we had about 60 community members that were part of that. And when we came out, we had our outcomes were we wanted every student was going to have a CTE experience. Every student was going to have the opportunity to earn at least 12 credits. Every student was going to have a work experience of some sort and that we were going to um, lead the county and ultimately the state as much as possible in student growth. And so part of that, we've been working through that process. We run, we update the community as we go along. We hold um, a, further meetings with that and it's just making sure. And when you do that, it gets everybody on board. We're proud that even though we, we do some um, publicity for schools of choice, word of mouth is, is our best thing. And we want people to be proud of what they've accomplished. And especially this year with what we've done, I mean, with opening school, we, we made the decision right off the bat, we're going to open early. So we opened before Labor Day. We have not missed a day, except for when the state shut us down. We took a very unique approach to scheduling our day. And that's really minimized. We've had no in-school transmission. We've had probably now less than 70 total cases that have, but there's quarantines with that, but we've been able to staff our building and maintain those um, options. And part of that was working with the community. We had health professionals, we had um, teachers and administrators and board members and all that on there. And we came up with a plan that's worked very well. All right, good evening, Mr. Jankowski. Good evening. I'm John DeRue, I'm the treasurer of the Anchor Bay School Board. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Uh, what is your biggest concern regarding the political climate of education in Michigan? And as our superintendent, how would you advocate for political action that benefits our district and public education throughout our state? I would say probably the, the biggest um, issue that you're going to face and because we're looking at it too, is they're, they're working, one, it's the, the new growth measures. Two, it's the funding mechanism because um, often now what you're looking at, you are not going to see, I mean, as, as I've had quite a, quite a bit of contact with like state legislators and so on, we brought the Senate Education Committee, the CR programs, we've had, um, the part of the House Education Committee a few years ago come through um, when Tim Kelly was the House Education Chair and the um, the Ways and Means um, Chair, we worked with him as well. And the the overriding thing is you are not going to see a general fund increase like typical. Um, you will see what you're seeing now. The proposal this morning was for. About $125 per student or a 2x formula. So Anchor Bay and Armada are, are similar. So you would see the 2x increase. And but then they could go up to $750 per student. However, the rest of that is going to be held in categoricals that they're going to put out there. And you have to kind of get out there and lobby and fight for those categoricals. Um, and the way you do that, and the way that we've done it is by talking to them and saying, this is what we're doing. Come out and see our program. See the success that we've had. And we did that, it was five years ago where we started and we're like, look, we're going to have, we brought them through, we brought, um, wasn't even one of our, um, it was a Senate, state senator from the west side of the state who wanted to come out and he brought all of the heads of the different organizations like the Michigan Association of Home Builders and um, Michigan, um, Society of Manufacturing and Engineers, and, and they came out and we talked about, okay, this is what we want to do. We want to build a system where kids are not just 
filling in bubbles where we, they're actually applying what they've learned. It's not just regurgitating facts. They're actually going to build things and apply that knowledge in a meaningful way and, and follow competencies to do that. And towards that, we were able to get it, a categorical built in. They committed, basically the Senate Education Committee in the House worked and they put $5 million into a four-year project. Um, 21J funds is, is the line item. And so we worked through that. The first year, it was just getting more knowledge about how do you do this. So there was a group of educators, um, part of another organization I'm the treasurer for, it's the, the um, it's for innovation and education. And so we worked through there. So then we had, we scheduled trips. We went to successful, notably successful schools around the country. We went to high tech high in, in California. There was another one in Wisconsin, Kettle Moraine. We went to um, Houston to see, this is what we're working towards. And so part of that, that first year was just a fact finding. The second year it came out with competitive grants. So then in the second year we wrote and we were able to earn one of those grants. And then the third year there was just slightly larger grants and we had that. From that, it kind of rolled into the Michigan Marshall Plan. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, everybody in the state seemed to go for it. We went for it, we worked. It was, I called Frazier and I called Centerline and said, I think this is something we could do. We could have a unique thing because um, their career, they had career academies. We required every student at that point, every student has to take two years of a CTE sequence. And so based off of that, we wrote our proposal and then we had to go through four rounds and we won a $1.5 million grant as part of that. And so I think that's, those are the things that you have to, to do is show that one, you have success, that two, that they are, it's an investment in good things. And we, we've been lucky. I mean, our teachers have been out there. They've been, they've presented at the state. They've been at the governor's education summit. They've um, testified before the house and the Senate and about the good things that they, people saw in their classroom. And it's based on that, then you have to make your own luck when it comes to funding. And, and that's how I like to work. Thank you. Uh, what are specific ways in which our district should be working with other local districts to foster community partnerships? Really, depending on depending on where districts are at and what they what their hopes and and what they want to accomplish. I'll tell you, I was amazed at the CTE offerings that you have, and I had never known that going in when I wrote. First thing was. Wow, there should be, I, I would have included you guys when we wrote for the Marshall Plan if I had known that because many districts had gotten rid of their CTE programs. So things like that, you look at Oakland County, they have CTE centers. And so it offers, it has increased offerings for every district. They do that, we did that at Fitzgerald. We were part of a four district consortium. We've worked with other districts. We've worked with Richmond. We had our academy. We work with them for AIS in order to send students there. And we do these shared partnerships. We've worked with other districts in order to help really whatever they need, whether it's cur curriculum experience, whether it's sharing um, our evaluation system, because it's such a tough business and resources are always scarce, especially when you're out where we are that whatever you can do to kind of share those experiences and share your knowledge in order to help everybody is, is really what you need to do in order to not only provide better opportunities for your students, but their students as well. All right. What impact has standardized testing and teacher accountability had on our education system in Michigan? This, this might be one where you have to uh, warn me that I might go over because this could be a three hour conversation in and of itself. Um, they, it goes through waves. Um, the, the first thing when you have standardized testing, originally it was meant to just kind of be a benchmark and, and it quickly moved in order to, to move past the benchmark and see where students are at to a system where you're going to rank and you're going to rate districts against each other. 
that is not necessarily um, a negative if you have the resources and you're doing things that you need to do. However, in order, how do you go about that? How do you hit those scores? Are you teaching to the test? Are you limiting? Um, I, another um, leadership position I do, I, I'm a lead evaluator for, it was advanced ed, it's now Cognia for the school accreditation. Done over 24 um, evaluations of districts, some in Macomb County. I've done ICs, Genesee IC was one where you go in and you examine what they're doing. And I've seen some where they got rid of opportunities. They got, a lot of them got rid of CTE programs because they were, their approach was we're only going to do core things. We're going to double dose them. And it's tough. It's tough for students. They don't see the connection. A lot of the things that, they, that bring them to school are those programs, the, the CTE programs and the extracurriculars. And so that's one of the things that you saw at First, the positive side effect of a lot of the testing is, especially with no child left behind. I know a lot of people don't like it, but for the first time it asks everybody to look at all students. Because you could go on for years and, and if you were over a certain threshold, you didn't have to worry about the rest of your students. But especially with the bottom 30 calculation, that's one where for the first time, every district was asked to look at what are those kids and what are they missing? And what are you going to do for those students in order to, to bring them up to speed? There's a lot that they could do with that. We've had some, um, some traction with the, the various state superintendents and with the legislature on trying to change that so it can at least be a positive. First, with the whole process and the way that it works, it is very self-defeating a lot of times where you have people, you take a test, they take it in the spring, you don't get the results until fall. It's already too late to, to do anything for that year. Now you have to wait an entire year to try and catch that up. So it would be better to take a system. And in this year, it was one of the, the positive things with the COVID legislation. And that was something that, that we lobbied for was let us use a benchmark. Everybody's using NWA. We were one of the first in the state to use it. We began using it as soon as I got to Armada. That gives good actionable data right away. You get it in the very next day. We test and let us test those kids on our schedule and then we'll send the results to the state and then they can do whatever they want. Because ultimately at the end of the day, I believe if you do what's best for kids and you teach the way that you know teachers are capable of teaching, the tests will handle themselves, but they have to stop the system of delaying results and not giving actionable data and let districts hold them accountable, but come up with some kind of system where it can be used in a meaningful fashion to improve opportunities for students. Thank you. What is the most difficult situation you've had to deal with in your educational career and how was it resolved? Probably the, the most difficult situation. We, when, when I got to Armada, we had a, we still do, it's a math science academy. And the, the way it was set up with the superintendent at the time, he, it was really, each building was kind of pitted against each other for resources, for um, accountability and everything. And so the high school, there was a regular, there's the traditional high school, our made high school, and then we had our um, math science academy. The difference, the level and resources per student was, was a little um, not fair, I would say. I know I'm biased as, as I was the high school principal and just the resources that were available and the focus for accountability. And when I moved up to central office, we started taking a critical eye at that. And by that point, we had added several AP classes. We had raised the performance level. So then the students at the traditional high school were outscoring the students in the math science academy by three to five points on the ACT at that point. However, it was many parents we're like, I love this program. I like everything about it. 
they were attached to the concept of it because their students were academy students. And so we went through, we decided to make changes. We had, we, we had a 50% attrition level in that program. So we'd start with 120, 150 students and then 75 would, would drop by the, the senior year. And part of that was in, in a lot of our advanced classes, we'd, have, we'd run an AP calculus class that would start with maybe 28 to 30 students. And at the end, so many students would drop, we'd be in the single digits. And it, it was just unsustainable. So we started to make changes with that. And we, we looked at things, we tried to look at them, just let the data drive where it's at. So we had a brilliant, brilliant Spanish teacher who had a math background. He worked our tutoring program, and, but he had never taught math in the district. And I remember we had two board meetings back to back where it was standing room only, all these parents in there because they didn't like that there were changes. And that we were putting, how dare you put a teacher in that who's never taught that, but it was a risk that we had to take in order to do what's best for students. And we moved other teachers around as well as part of that, because we looked at what were their growth scores? How could we do that? How could we move them there? And it, it was tough for everybody involved. However, once we got to the next school year and we started, and this is the first time that I, I just remember on parent-teacher conferences going around. I had parents who were angry at the board meeting and still one of the best emails I ever um, received from a parent thanking and saying, you know, I thought you were out of your mind when you made these changes. But these teachers, they're the best teachers that I've ever had. My kids, just the amount of stress level and what they're doing. And then when those students started performing so well, it, it, it's just been a positive atmosphere for everybody and it's worked very well for the students. It, it's allowed us to raise their test scores across. And now as part of our winter made up, students can go back and forth and there's not that separate um, culture anymore and they work very well together. And it's turned out, it was a tough process to go through, but we stuck to our guns and I think it's paid off remarkably. And it has, if you look at our achievement. How do you lead without having official authority over the people involved? Have you been in that situation before in your career? And if so, how did you handle it? Yeah, it, it's one of the hardest things, especially um, when I first started teaching I, at Fitzgerald, that's where I graduated from. So went back, I was um, working on the school improvement team, didn't have the title um, of school improvement chair yet. But now you're trying to lead teachers who I had when I was a student there. And they're remembering that it's, you know, this is a young kid that they had in class. And I was a good student and all that, but still there, there's that, there's always that friction. And you have to show them, you have to show them that you're committed, that you're going to go above, that you're going to keep them informed. And um, they'll probably tell you that I gave them too much information along the way, because a lot of our discussions would be, we'd roll into, this is why we want to do what we want to do. And they'd be like, oh, no, no. Okay, I get it. And you just have to be prepared. You have to support them in whatever way possible. And then once they understand that your, your heart is coming from the right spot and that you really, we all want what's best for kids. We all want what's best for the district. And once they see that and people start moving in the same direction, you will still have like some issues and all that, but they'll know you for just being a genuine person. And th then you just develop a reputation for, for that. And people are, are willing to follow that. Yep. What are the key elements needed to establish and maintain a good working relationship between you and our board? I, I, I believe the, the first element is one to make sure that everybody knows where they're coming from, that it, we understand what are the expectations, what, how do we want to communicate? And then it's the goals that kind of go into that. What, if we're all working towards the same thing, we should have common goals. Then at that point, it's just communication. It's just making sure that everybody, whether it's a weekly update, whether it's, it's 
consistent emails or however, whatever the pleasure of the board is and how you want to be communicated with. It's just making sure that we're all paying attention, that we, we know what's going on, that if you have questions, that ask the questions and in making sure that we're keeping what's important and those goals first and foremost, and that we're working towards that. And if we do that and we, we work at, through the communication, then I think that's 90% of the issues that you're going to run into is like, there should never be a situation where I put the board in a position where they have to vote on something without seeing information before. They should be able to see it, ask questions beforehand. My, my current process has always been with the board. I'm, I'll tell our board now, I'll, in three months, you're probably going to see this. Okay, look for this. When I, I do my curriculum update, it has links to everything to, to back it up. So if you, if you wanna read on assessment and why we're doing this assessment system, if you wanna do that, there's more than enough information. And then the next board meeting, I'll do a short presentation on it and say, okay, any questions? And then if we have to vote on, there has to be a vote, then that would be the following board meeting. And it's worked very well in that everybody is on the same page. They know where we're coming from. There are no surprises. And, and that's, I think, a pattern that works well. Given your research on our district, what do you believe our vision for the future should be? And how might you engage the entire district in pursuit of this vision? I, I, I think overall, looking at, um, just following on the website, looking at um, some of the things that you've accomplished, I think with your career programs, I think that's one where, again, if you were to look at something, it worked very well in, for us and I think every district, and I think there's funding out there if you wanted it, where if you had every student have to go through a, a CTE sequence, it might take some creativity on doing things, but the one thing that we learned is there's now not a two-tier system where it's like, oh, your college, oh, your CT, everybody's going through that. All of your students then get to see each other and see their strengths in, in all of that. And I think the other side of that is students, not only do they learn what they wanna go into, but they learn what they don't wanna go into. And I think that's important for, for kids. The other, uh, in addition to that, I think that students, by taking that approach, it really, there's a lot of opportunities because we know Looking at the, the demographics, I, I do the demographics for the county and see where it's at. One of the leading, um, most important things to drive test scores, poverty is one, but the second most important thing is parent educational value. And I would argue if you look at the SAT scores that in the state, that parent education actually drives scores more. And at Ar Armada, 80, it used to be 85%. Now it's about 80 of our students are still first in their um, family, first generation to go to college. And while we are not a poor district and in Anchor Bay, I know your demographics are very close to ours. We're not a rich district either. So we've learned by going through the CTE programs and offering that to students and we focus on career certifications. So we don't want students getting you know, in at the ground level in their careers. We want them starting at that second rung on the ladder. And I can speak just um, directly from personal experience. My daughter, we have a, a certified nursing assistant program. She went through that. She ended up having the certified nursing assistant. She worked um, throughout college. She was able to work as a SENA. She made really good money. There's tuition reimbursements that they have. So even though she had a full ride, she was still able to, to take advantage. And we've had many students do that because they get to start in their career. And if they, they find something they love, they're really moving on. And I think it really helps overall to one, get, have each student get a pathway. And if we can kind of move towards that and, and especially move your seat. I was looking through course offerings and all that. I know most of your CT programs start at the high school. I would involve that even back to the middle school where they can get some experience in there have those conversations, even in elementary school. 
I noticed on the monitors outside that they were talking about Zello. We were the first, one of the first districts to pilot the Zello program. That can go all the way down to elementary school. And because the most important thing is if you can get kids connected to a path and then they'll do whatever it takes to protect that path. And then you can have opportunities. And then counselors are now talking about, okay, what scholarships can we get? And we've had, I, I believe each of the last two years, we've had our graduating class is about 150, but they've earned over two and a half to $3 million worth of scholarships. Many of that just in, based off of those career opportunities that they've had. So I think that one can solidify all of the district kind of moving in one direction towards that around opportunities for students. And I think it's something that the community and the parents, I know our parents, just the opportunities that we have that students are walking out with college credits and career certifications, it's, it's been a tremendous advantage for us. Good evening, Mr. Jankowski, I'm Jill. And I'm going to ask you three questions focusing on instruction and curriculum. Please give us examples of educational change or reform that you have initiated in your current or previous positions that have led to improvements in student learning. We have um, about 12 years ago, we started, the MD had a competition for lack of a better word, it was for Project Reimagine. They wanted to reimagine education. And as part of that, we started looking at how can we change um, instruction? How can we work towards um, making sure that what we're doing is as effective as possible? And so towards that end, we started looking at one, standards-based or competency-based education that, that began at that point making sure that what, if we're going to say, because what is a B, you know, in a class? What does it mean? We want to be able to communicate to parents and students that there's something behind it, that there's a certain level of mastery that they have. And so we've started working through that towards that end with instruction, we, we adopted classroom instruction that works. And we actually had, it was your high school principal. Um, he trained our teachers on Saturday mornings in order to make sure that everybody was along using those same nine strategies and so that was the first thing that kind of started us on, a, on our pathway in order to make sure that our instruction that we knew what we needed to do and that we knew what standards that we were going to hit and then make sure that we were going to measure those secondly in whether it was at that point, it was NWA to start. And meanwhile, teachers were working on their own assessments so that they could kind of have connection to that. And then once you know, as you're doing a formative assessment, what do you do then? Okay, if I'm halfway through a unit and now I need to change, then working on, okay, how can we go back and remediate that? And then just kind of holding um, students accountable to that, our math department. They, we started talking about, okay, what are our power standards? And so we worked through that and it was, okay, these are the 14 things that they need to know. So one, now we have instruction down, now we have our assessment down. So how do we feel about that? When, when is learning confined to 12 weeks or 20 weeks, depending on what type of schedule you're on? No. So then let's give those kids an opportunity to retake tests, but in exchange, they have to pass every assessment and they have to pass those standards. The math department said, we, we feel every single one and we're going to pilot this. And I said, okay, well, we'll go everyone. And I know we might get some pushback from parents. We didn't hear anything um, from parents. They were very supportive. Did hear some pushback from kids. I remember one student came to me, he's like, this is not fair. And I said, well, why is it not fair? He's like, I actually have to know this stuff now. It's like before I could just get to, I just had to know enough and get through the next two weeks. The other part of it is we started circling back. So your next assessment, 40% of it should be, we're teaching for retention. We wanna make sure that they know. And so we built that in. We started using um, exam view as part of that system. And we, we had the rudimentary basics for that. And then we've moved that up now where 
now we want to make sure that the kids can do things with what with their instruction and it's not just filling in bubbles or or worksheet so we've been working on project-based learning and at the elementary we call it genius hour or thinkering labs where they learn they have the background now they have to apply it in a meaningful way they do presentations we've had them do presentations to the board we've had them do presentations to the community and they now have to call upon from each of the different subject areas and put something together and plan through and have everything together and that's worked out very well and it's really driven student engagement and it's driven our um, student achievement we i don't know if you're familiar with the evas system that the state has been running behind the scenes it's the evaa s it's the education value-added assessment system something that you just Right now it's voluntary, but any grant that you write from the state, they ask you, are you going to participate in the data hub? Are you going to be part of the system? And it puts a growth system, a growth measurement based off of our students are doing. And our fifth grade where we started piloting this, they're in the top five percentile in the state now because, and, and that's really worked well. Not only are parents happy because their students are more engaged, um, students are doing better and part of that the, just the students are motivated because we put in a system where if a student gets 80 percent then they've mastered that concept but if they want to be a coach and help and and take the challenge activities they need to get 100 percent one of our fifth grade teachers was like i have five students here who aced everything but had but only got a 95 and they want to come in and retake the test so that they can get a hundred because they want to be a coach and they want to take the challenge activities. And then we knew we were onto something at that point. Thank you for that response. What do you believe are currently the biggest challenges with special education in our region and how should these challenges be addressed? Special education, um, part of it is the challenge is, is always making sure that you have the services that students need and making sure that when it's an IEP, which is an individual education plan, it is truly individual and it's truly supportive of students. And we have tremendous um, special education teachers and we've changed kind of the approach to special education. When I first arrived in the district, it was very much where we had a lot of self-contained classrooms where we, if students were special ed designated, then they were just basically given a lower curriculum and not um, challenged as much. And we made the conscious effort to really try and, we wanna close the gap for the students as much as possible. We wanna give them as many opportunities as much as possible. So. 85% of our students are in regular ed classrooms as much as possible. And the, we provide supports, whether it's a one-to-one -one aid, whether it's a resource class, and we put that those in place in order to make sure that they have those opportunities. We've started a really innovative career option with some of the local businesses where those students can go out and they can get experiences as well, because we want every student to have a career experience. And we've seen growth on par for most of our special education students of one and a half years to two years. And not only that, we were the only district to hit all of our benchmarks for the state reporting in special education um, for three of the last five years. And on a regional basis, there's a dire need for more um, assistance at the north end of the county. I mean, there are a lot of center programs and, and um, resources that go towards the south end of the county. And I think sometimes we get short shrift because the, they just feel, well, you know, you don't have as many special ed students or it's a long drive, we're not going to do that. So anything that we can do regionally in order to provide that. We've had discussions with other districts of what can we do to kind of coordinate more with that. We've talked to Richmond, we've talked to Romeo, and just working on what can we do in order to make sure that we're integrated those programs that we're 
whether it's working with um, the state or whether it's working with the ISD in order to provide that. Thank you. How would you meet the needs of college readiness while also providing high quality, relevant career focused opportunities for students? I, I think it, you, the, the best way to put it is to not make students choose. You have to, we are beyond that point. We know all of our students are going to have careers. We know that we, most parents want their students to have college opportunities. One, it, it's very difficult in order to um, get those opportunities outside if they're the first in their family, because they don't know. Their parents might not know how to apply to college, might not know about that. And we know, just even when we were doing research for the Marshall Plan, up until fifth grade, most kids, they have a limited idea of careers. And it needs to be kind of part and parcel through instruction, even in elementary and moving on up. Because by fifth grade, 80% of students, and there's abundance of research that shows this, they've limited their options to what they know in their family. It's either what mom did, dad did, aunt, uncle, or whatever. And so once they do that, it's very difficult to get them to look at those careers that might be um, in demand going forward. And that was the whole essence of the Marshall Plan was to, to build careers for the top 50 in demand um, pathways. As part of that, like, like I mentioned, we, we went right off the bat and said, we are going to require all students, they're going to take basically college prep in, in a, a CTE sequence. That's part of it. We also, just as an aside, we require every student to take financial literacy over and above that because it's that important for them to be well-rounded. And that starts in elementary school. They start talking about careers as part of our think ring. We bring in people from outside. It might be an engineer because that's, we want them to know what an engineer is. We do a small career fair where we're bringing people in so they can see that whether it's Caterpillar or we have a great partnership with um, the Operating Engineers Union 324. I don't know if, you're, if you ever get a chance to go out there, it's coming up um, in May. They have almost every skilled trade that you want. And you can go through that, whether it's iron worker, concrete, um, heavy machinery, and having those partnerships and bringing those kids through there. And then, because now all of a sudden it opens their eyes and they see what, their, um, what the possibilities are. So, and then in middle school, what we do is we start looking at it from an app. We, we need to move from career interest to career aptitude. Okay, if you want to, if you want to be a doctor and you faint at the sight of blood, that might be a problem. So let's give them those experiences. Let's. So we've moved a lot of our CD programs to the middle school where they start, and it's just experiential. So we want them. It's our medical sciences program which we started. We have over 200 students that are in that program. Um, we have um, engineering. We have um, culinary arts, we have our building trades, we have our business classes and so on. So they get those experiences. And not only that, they get real life experiences. So they're involved in MITES. They're involved in HOSA. We have one of the largest contingents in the state of HOSA. And we were the first middle school um, HOSA group in the state. And we had the first groups that went to the, the, the nationals from middle school and our, from the high school. So it's part and parcel of all that. We've done a lot with curriculum to make sure that those classes, because we know algebra too, you can, our renewable energy counts as algebra too. So you can help get college prepared through those classes. And then ultimately we try and place students. We started a program, we won a national award for it called it Accepted. So every student, we wanna place every student. Our counselors talk to every single student, where are you going? And then once it, we don't, it doesn't matter if it's college or it's career training or the military, we have quite a few kids go there. Once they have their, they know where they're going and they get accepted to that, they get a t-shirt, we play it up. We do, whether it's a signing ceremony or something like that, we just, because we want kids to know and see that. And it's not a decision of either or, you, you want them to do both. Good evening, I'm Dennis Richards, school board trustee. I have four questions around finances. 
What is your experience with millage renewals, bond proposals, and sinking fund proposals? What is the key to the success of such initiatives? We have been lucky to have the support of our community, and we've passed all of those in the last um, several years. We just we did a construction bond. We were just wrapping that up. We did a technology bond as well. We have a sinking fund, and first, it's communicating with the the community having a committee we brought a committee in basically ask them what what's important to you and it was amazing how many people came out for that because they wanted to be involved and they wanted to have and and we did a whole process that i led where we basically throw everything out there put all your ideas out there what you need we walked them through we took them through the building so they could see what what we saw and we just wanted to be open and transparent with people we talked about, you know, how is how are these funded and how does that work and, and why it, it's not a tax increase because um, the way that you structure those things and it was very successful in doing that because they understood that and then and then it's just getting the message out on this is what it's for that this is what we hope to accomplish if it's tied to your mission and what you're trying to do and trying opportunities for kids, then you need to let people know that. And we've been lucky in that they've passed by healthy margins every time. And we have our sinking fund renewal is going to come up, but um, I, I have no concern about it um, not being renewed just because it, the community has been very appreciative of what we've done. Please describe your experience with budget development and financial management, including making difficult budget reductions. I'm very blessed to work for a superintendent who is an excellent um, finance person. That was his background. He was our assistant superintendent for business. And he's given me uh, many, many opportunities um, to see, to work through the budget. When it comes to negotiations now, I actually, develop, this is where our budget's at, this is what the projections are, this is what I think we can afford. Um, we had five years ago when we were going to negotiations, just looking at the lay of the land, talking, knowing where um, the legislature was going. And at that point in time, I went to them and said, okay, here, this is, I wanna go for a five-year contract. I wanna give teachers the steps every year. And here's how I want to structure it. And we basically did, it was an overhaul of the entire compensation system for teachers. And he was taken aback at first. And he's like, this is like mad scientist. He's like, I don't know if they're going to take this. And I said, okay. He's like, but I want to see you put it across the table. Met with the union, put it across the table. That was interesting. Great. We have a great relationship with the union. They were a little taken aback at first, but then three weeks later, when we the next time we met, they were like, oh, we see some promise in this. We see that teachers are going to get increases every year. Teachers are going to have opportunities. It's going to help the district. At that point, just for some background, we were at less than a 1% fund equity. And then I had to convince the board. We took it to the board and I said, well, this is the lay of the land. This is where I see funding going. These are the grants that we're working on. These are the things, and it was a leap of faith for them, especially go five years. I remember I'm part of the, the Macomb Human Resources Group, and they go around, and at that point, everybody's cutting or freezes and everything, and then get to Armada, and I'm like, well, we're going for a five year. We're going to give teachers increases every year. We're going to do this, and these are some creative things. And people, it, the Richmond superintendent actually said, you're going to be broke in two years. So we just finished that contract. Our teachers are the only teachers in not only Macomb County, but in the, the five county area, if it's Wayne, Oakland, Macomb, St. Clair, Lapeer, that have been able to maintain increases in uh, when adjusted for inflation. There are districts that have taken $18,000 pay cuts for their teachers. Not only that, our fund equity is the highest it's probably ever been in 10 years because we trusted in our teachers. We gave them 
the belief behind that, that has helped our programs, that has helped our school, schools of choice because we offer more programs. And like I said, we're net positive against all of that. And it was a, a risk, but it worked out very well. And a lot of it's just being creative with what they have. And we just settled again for this year. We have a three-year contract that we just settled and we're kind of patterning it off of the same thing. And we, we think that we'll be able to maintain at least a 10% fund equity going forward with and do right by our staff on all levels. And part of that is just being creative and you have to go back and say, I call it the money ball approach. We're going to, we have to look seriously about, are we going to do what's going to make a difference? And are we going to fund it? You fund what you believe in, you fund what's effective. And then sometimes you have to make cuts as part of that. Um, the, when it comes to cuts, my approach has always been, we'll find a way. We'll find a way to, if it's a program that we care about, we'll write grants, written millions of dollars of grants. My goal is always every year to write enough grants to offset my salary. I've been able to do that now um, two times over, basically, each year. So then in order to do that, to find those programs, to keep those things going. Otherwise, we look at it and then we tell teachers, hey, if you want this program and this is something, then we need your help in selling this program. And we try and be upfront. We've had programs that we've had to cut because of enrollment. And it's, but we try and be upfront and say, here's the threshold. We need X number of students. We need these things. And if you can, if we can get those and it, you have to sell your program. And if you do, then we'll maintain it. If not, then they know going in and we make those adjustments accordingly. What opportunities do you believe budget limitations present? In tough financial times, what are your top three priorities? I, I believe that, especially, again, if you, you guys are the, are the same situation as we are, I think we get $140 less per student on the FTE basis, total, total funding, than you do. So you know that you know, you've learned what to do with a tough budget. I mean, you have to make decisions and you really have to kind of um, look at things critically because it's, it's a math problem at the end of the day. The first thing is you want to make sure that your kids are the last thing to, to be affected. Class size is important. We, in our contract, we do not have limits on class size. However, we probably um, have some of the smallest class sizes this year, especially. We, we have the smallest average class sizes, I would argue. Um, that's so keeping that, um, to a manageable opportunities for kids. If it's something that's tied to a program where it's essential, where it's a unique opportunity for students, like we are one of, I think two districts in Macomb County that still has a strings program. That's hugely important for us that those students, they start in fifth grade. We want to keep those opportunities for those kids we will go to the ends of the earth in order to try and preserve that program as much as possible because it's a unique opportunity we'll not get elsewhere. Same thing with career opportunities. So making sure that we're preserving that and then just being able to support teachers. We know teachers pay money out of their pocket. We know my typical conversation with teachers, I tell them, just give me heads up as much as possible. I will find money if you are interested in this i if i've i tell them 30 days i'm pretty good 60 days i'm i'm better 90 days i can probably find a grant and get it funded if it's a small enough um, amount and we've done great things we've worked with other groups we're we're starting we're working on a fire academy and we've had a donated fire truck we've had a donated ambulance we went down to gross point and they had their uh, they were getting rid of all of their gear because for them after three years it they can't use it in the field but we can use it for training so then they donated all of that to us so we go out there and we do what we can we for a while there when we couldn't upgrade our technology as before we did our tech bond we went to Baker College. They upgrade theirs every two years. So they would give us their two-year-old equipment. And it's finding, being able to support those people because we want teachers to know that we'll find a way. 
And funding is oftentimes it, it's it's a big concern, and we want to make sure that kids have those opportunities. Same thing with our Cisco networking program. Conversation just today with a teacher. It's like, okay, we're going to fund the testing for the kids. We're going to take that out of a grant that I wrote, and we're going to give those opportunities for kids. And it, you, if there's a will, there's a way. What opportunities might you explore to raise additional revenue for the district? Have you had success in procuring additional funds for your district? Yes, as I mentioned, we've, and I think I listed them in my resume, just some of the grants that we've written, whether it's a Marshall plan, which is 1.5 million, whether it's the 21J funding, the separate funding line, which um, I, that's been about 65,000 per grant, um, whether it's going to local businesses. Um, and I sit on the, the scholarship board for one business. And so as I've gotten to know them, they've been very supportive. And so they, they would be like, what can we do? How can we help you? So each year they've come up with um, five to ten thousand dollar grants that then, then I take it to a teacher and say okay if I five five thousand dollars what can you do with this and then I'll be here's the grant because now I've been working on trying to get them to try and here's how you write a grant here's how you can do that so that we can kind of um, expand capacity and so we funded programs that way like I mentioned just with talking to the legislature you know getting those line items. I mean, you have to sell your program. You have to show that you're being successful and that there's, this is an investment opportunity when it comes to um, the political side of things, because they want to, if it goes well, they want to have you out there and they want to do that. So you bring them out and they will put in, you see this every year. There's probably the categoricals, there's probably almost 20 to $30 million in categoricals. So if you have a program and you can get together with other districts, there's people that will support that and put it in there. You see it with algebra nation. That is one that I don't know if you're familiar with that categorical that gets in there because there's a couple of districts and there's a vendor that pushes for it. Well, they, they fund that. I think it's, um, it might be up to three to $5 million, but for them, that's nothing, but for a school district, I mean, I think your fund equity is what, just over 1.5 million. If you can get another $3 million to run your programs. I think that's amazing. Thank you. All right, sir, I have your last four questions. Regards to staff and personnel is where mm -hmm. they're focused largely. How would you interact with other administrators in our district? How would you strike a balance between giving them the support and autonomy they need to lead effectively while holding them accountable as necessary? I think it's important um, to, to make sure that you're working as a team. The, the methodology that we kind of adopted now just um, through practice is the, we meet as administrators um, twice a month and we do a separate building administrator, building principal meeting, and then we do um, central office and building administrators. And we're, I set the agenda, but we set that out there. Here's the structure of what we're talking about. And then anybody can add to that. They can add any concepts that they have. And so we make sure that everything we put on there so that one, we can track that going forward and we can make sure any questions need to be answered. And then we communicate and we've, we meet as needed. We've been meeting on some Sundays even because we knew when we're coming back from, you know, certain breaks that, we wanted to know where are we at with our staffing? Do we have enough people? So whatever they need, we try and, and do that. At any time they can contact me and they, they do because we're constantly working through making sure. And then we also try and reach out and say, okay, what are, you know, you're, you're handling business. And a lot of times when you get into the, the flow of the year, it's about putting out fires and this is what's going on. Anytime you're dealing with thousands of um, people, things will happen. But then you also want to make sure that you're putting those aspirational things in there. What do we want to do? What are we moving towards? You need to be able to set too many districts are moving away from stuff. They're saying, oh, that didn't work or we're not doing well here. We need to, to not do that. And they're just not setting a goal and a vision and moving towards that. 
So we have those discussions. We, we took a day in order to go through, okay, what now that we did strategic planning, what does that look like? And what's that going to be in each building? We talked through that as um, an admin team. And then that now becomes the goals that they have in their evaluation. And then you check in on those as you're going through, you talk to them. Okay, we said we're doing this, this, and this. Where are we at? Give us a status update. And then you just constantly, again, it's communication. You work through that. You set what's our vision of success. If this is our goal, how do we define success when it comes to that? And then we also like to have them present to the board as much as possible because we want them, we want board members to hear from them so that again, as a entire leadership group, we're having these conversations and, and then you just hold them accountable to that because we have a great admin team. We have just they're the, some of the most dedicated people, all of our administrators um, currently have been there for at least 10 years and that's worked well and we've communicated well. And I think that's a testament to um, taking that approach. Please describe your most successful experience in building a high performing work team. I would uh, just really are, I would say that our um, initiatives in the Marshall Plan has probably been the most gratifying um, part of it. We worked for it, we've lobbied for that to be um, an opportunity at the state level. We went through and we talked to, um, we kind of presented to teachers, I think at the point they were like, we're never going to get this, we're, you know, we're, you know, we're just farm aid. A lot of times people will say we're just this little district and, and it, we sold them on, on a vision of this is what we're going to do. And then the administrators, we kind of put everything into that and worked on, okay, this is where we're headed. Let's, and then we had to work with two other districts as well. And then we had to shepherd that through three rounds uh, at the state level in order to do that. And then Amazingly, we got called everybody who put in for it, and I think it was 120 districts put in for it. That was um, whittled down to, I believe it was 39 um, entities. These are ISDs as well. And we had partnerships with Ferris. We had partnerships with um, Macomb Community College. We had partnerships with several businesses, all the major healthcare providers. And it came down to this one day, they were like, we want everybody to come here for the award ceremony. And we went there and nobody knew whether you had it at that point. And when we were one of nine um, groups to get that, it was probably right there, the most gratifying things. Not only the, the funding was nice, but just the affirmation that, the, that our vision and what we wanted to do is um, you know, the state believes in us as well. And that this is something that could be transformational for our district. You've mentioned a couple times your relationship with the union. Mm -hmm. If we were to reach out to the presidents of your teachers union, how would they describe you to us? I, I think he would tell you um, pr pretty much straight shooter going to tell them that we, we, get, we have a, an excellent relationship. Um, we, you have to communicate openly. We put, this is what we need. This is what we want out there. They do the same. We don't waste time like with games or anything like that. And we come to agreement. We have never had a grievance in the time I've been there. So that's 14 years. We've worked through every single situation. We communicate directly in several times, whether it's the, the president or the vice president. He would probably tell you that um, probably give way too much information on a lot of things because he'll ask a question. I'll be like, well, there's five reasons for that. And then he'll, after the second one, he's like, no, no, I get it. Okay. Just go on. Um, but at the end of the day, it's built on trust and it's built on, they know that we want to do what's best for our staff, whether it's through contract negotiations, whether it's through handling opportunities. And um, it doesn't mean that we don't have disagreements. We, we do, but I think there's respect behind those disagreements and the not disagreements on small stuff. It it's disagreement on things that are essential. Like how are, 
how are we going to grade? What is going to be our approach on those? And those are really what you want to get to is having discussions on what's the vision, what's going to move us forward. And last but not least. <laughs> yell at you is that yeah, appropriate yeah that's that's fine use my outside coaching <laughs> yeah. voice what would you suggest in terms of a comprehensive professional development plan for our educators specifically what would be the key priority areas as well as the delivery system i i would say professional development it needs to be tied to what they're actually doing in the classroom um, one of the things that we've done and we've worked on is um, I'm a huge fan of national board certification, wrote a grant for about $25,000 in order to have our teachers um, work towards national board certification. We began with a, a cohort and it re asks them to examine what they're doing in their classroom. They have to look at what's successful. They have to reflect on what's not successful. And we brought in an outside coach to kind of like help them through that. And it's been, my union president was one of them. And they really worked as a cohort to kind of, to, to analyze these things. And it was a very successful approach. And we had, so we had, the first cohort, everybody has made it through. Now we have two that are going through. We built it into the contract as well as a stipend if they get that. And now they qualify for that teacher leader certification, which is a step above its third tier. It's one of the offerings that we have as part of, I'm also president of the Network of Michigan Educators. It's a group for um, teachers of the year, administrators of the year, Millican award winners. And so those resources we kind of bring in order to help them and provide assistance and funding. And that's been huge. So we've actually built it into the evaluation system as well, because a lot of those things like peer coaching. So we built it in where we don't want it for us. We don't want, it's not for teachers to kind of like observe somebody and then rat them out. It's to understand the connections between each other's class. So in non COVID years, they'll, they sit in other teachers' classrooms, then they write reflections on what they've learned from the process, not what the other teacher's doing. They have those conversations. We piloted that with the teachers, we, and it, it was unanimous because a lot of them hadn't done that. So the first year, many did it within their own grade levels. Then they started doing it across buildings. And not only has it helped people learn because they, oh, I see you're using this strategy. This is great, we can do that. It's built more unity across the staff. They've seen more of those. The other thing, we have them do portfolios because that's also part of the um, NBCT process. So there's that fourth, we use the Danielson. I know you, um, Anchor Bay, you use the uh, five dimensions, but there's all those things like what service to um, the profession, leadership and all that, we want them to be able to put that out there. And it's helped, it, it's helped develop teachers. It's, we've used it um, to promote our teachers. We've had more county teachers of the year since I've been there. I think we, we've had five or six right now. We've had another principal of the year. We've had a Millican award winner because not only do we know what they're doing and it builds this um, cohesiveness between the staff. And I think ultimately it drives student achievement. Thank you. Um, we're doing well on time. So we want to give you a few minutes uh, to provide you with an opportunity to ask any questions that you might have of the board. Okay. I, I know budget is always an issue, but outside of budget, what would be your three, um, concerns that you have going forward that the three most pressing concerns besides budget. So I'm going to open it up if any board members would like to respond individually. Okay. 
I don't know if I can come up with three offhand for myself, but, okay. um, you know, I, I think, you know, I'm looking for a superintendent and um, the needs of our district right now is um, I, I see, you know, um, pulling, you know, somebody that can pull our community together and, you know, and become a part of that community, um, because I think that's important here. And, um, and also, you know, that we can continue to maintain curricular growth, um, mm -hmm. like you had said, um, you know, because we know that demographics change, you mm -hmm. know, and if you don't continue to change with your demographics, you will eventually find yourself behind. Absolutely. So um, to me, that's a, that's something that I would like to be looking forward towards. Um, and, you know, that we, we do well with test scores and we're very proud of them. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, in the mm -hmm. long term that we are setting ourselves up to stay that way. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, those are three, three things for me. Um, or two things, I should say. And I don't know if any other board members want to add. I'll just jump in with a, a quick note. I agree with Ms. Berkmeyer as far as I'm very involved in the community. I mm -hmm. like to see our superintendents out in the community involved, hands on. It sounds like you have that experience working with fire chiefs, police chiefs, mayors, mm -hmm. local uh, and state officials. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that I've, I've noticed over the past uh, several months is that our relations have improved with our unions. And I want to continue that trend in a positive relationship because I expect the superintendent mm -hmm. to bring, you know, the, all of our different unions, all of our different units in those unions together and to enter into, you know, negotiations and, and come out. You know, I was excited to hear that you said you had, honestly, that you had five-year mm -hmm. uh, agreement and then you went to a three-year agreement. Uh, those are the things that I think probably all of us are looking for in terms of longer term agreements. And certainly mm -hmm. our teachers are looking for some stability rather than one year agreements that absolutely sometimes tend to expire before we start the next school year. Mm -hmm. Okay. My other question would be if, if I was lucky enough to be named the next superintendent and we're sitting here a year from now and it's my evaluation, what would a successful first year look like? I think we kind of already answered that question, at least Ms. Berkmeyer and I did, um, with the community relations, mm -hmm. the relationships with our teachers and our unions. Uh, obviously, we have a, uh, and Mr. Drew probably take it some of his comments, he's the chair of our finance committee. Mm -hmm along with Mr. Middlestad and myself are on the committee. We obviously have financial concerns. We, mm -hmm. the same that you have with the numbers coming out of Lansing, when are we gonna get the numbers? What are they gonna be? Mm -hmm. What's that picture gonna be painted like? Uh, it's, that keeps me awake at night because I wanna make sure that we can keep those 16 CTE programs mm -hmm. that we have. So I would say, you know, balancing a budget, figuring out how we can be in the black, uh, potentially another issue aside from the other two would be, uh, you know, garnering some additional students uh, trying to get our enrollment numbers back up. And as you've already mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned that we, we've we lost some students to you know the private academies, mm -hmm. to some of the, the Catholic and Lutheran schools in the area. Uh, and we'd like to try to win those folks back uh, so we can get that uh, FTE back, get our numbers back up so we don't have to worry about staffing and cutting transportation or food services or cutting something to try mm -hmm. to save money. That would definitely be high on my list. Okay, yeah. Um, I just wanted to add to that in a year, uh, if you were chosen, I would like to see the relationships that you've built community-wide from student, like you said, you sit in the same spot all the time. I want everybody to know who you are mm -hmm. and have had some sort of interaction okay. Okay. with you, because um, I think those relationships are really important. Thank you. To echo that, I, I would just add, you know, I, I recognize that, um, you know, in hiring a new superintendent, you know, that everybody is going to have their, their course and, mm -hmm. you know, try to move our ship a little bit, you know, where the direction that they think we need to be. Um, so like Ms. Knox said, I would like to see, at least in that first year, you know, the relationship building um, mm -hmm. to set the ground for, you know, the curricular changes and mm -hmm. anything else, because I think, like like you've said and other candidates have said without without those relationships and that trust 
you know, it, it makes it difficult to make those changes and have everybody on board. So, um, you know, re relationships would be high on my expectation in the first year. Thank you. I, I guess I'll jump in here as, as well. And it's along the lines of what the three other board members talked about is we need that person at the top that's gonna bring together a lot of passionate people. I'm sure you've watched our district over the last mm -hmm. couple of years and it's really gonna take, you got passionate board members at times with different views. You got passionate mm -hmm. union leaders, passionate parents, but everybody looking to make this district better, keep it as good, like I should say, keep it as good as it is, mm -hmm. maybe step it up a notch and uh, just need that person at the top that has that, uh, moxie i guess to to bring it all together and so if you say a year from now you know if you're the guy it, uh, that would be what i'd be looking for to understand how to bring that together yeah. you know and then on a personal level i'm big on the cte obviously and especially when it comes to building trades i'm a plumber and i think that those programs in high schools need to be taken to another level Absolutely. when it comes to all construction trades mm -hmm. and uh so that'd be something i'd be looking for okay Thank you. Okay. So we have about five minutes remaining. Um, in closing, is there anything you'd like to add for the board? Yeah, ju just in summary, um, just to kind of sum up everything that I believe I can offer to Anchor Bay, it it's a challenging time in education. This is probably between budgets, between COVID, between policy changes and mandates and all of that, and other struggles, it, it's it's a tough time to be in education. And with so many obstacles and hurdles and everything coming at you, it's essential to get people moving in, like you said, in the same direction. I think I've shown that um, through my experience in, in the student achievement and the things that we've accomplished both at Fitzgerald and at Armada. And I think I agree, it's important for Anchor Bay to have a leader that has experience in navigating the challenging times with success. Every born and raised in Macomb County, been in challenging situations in both times and have led the way and improved student achievement. Out of my 25 years in education, 23 years of that, We've improved test scores and moved forward and and been at the top of you know providing opportunities for students. It it's tough in Macomb County, as I mentioned. I mean, we get half of the funding, but all the mandates that the rest of the state has. Um, we know that the state now there's discussions going on. There's the the one um, work group that it's going to be. They're looking at how to reimagine education kind of like what happened um, in New Orleans after the hurricane. So they're talking about what are those aspects? I think we've built a system in Armada that's been successful and it's been part of that. You'll, you'll see parts of that from the state. And I think being part of that, I think that's an opportunity um, for me to offer that expertise to Anchor Bay in leading those in getting the district ready for those challenges over the next six years. I think that my experience in improving student achievement in negotiations, technology, building and site, um, instruction, assessment, budget, and all of that, those are experiences that have provided dividends for every district I've been in. And we've gotten uncommon achievement much above our surrounding or similarly situated districts. And that's the, the um, what I hope to bring to Anchor Bay. And I, I know we're so close geographically and demographically, I know a lot of districts. You have a tremendous amount of um, untapped potential of teachers and administrators who are willing to do good things. And I know they're looking for something to lead them and give them those opportunities to get out and to advocate for students. And I know they, because whenever you get into these things, they they contact our teachers and they say, oh, you know, this is, is he this type of person or that type of person? And it's to give them the opportunities to, to kind of develop that capacity to get everybody moving in the same direction. I think my commitment to you is that 
I will work with the board. I will work with the teachers. I will work with the students, the staff and everybody. And we'll go above and beyond to build those connections, whether it's with businesses, whether it's with state associations in order to make that happen. To my personal motto is to do whatever it takes in order to increase student achievement and support teachers. And it's sometimes there's tough decisions. I've have a history of making those and they pay off ultimately and they have paid off and I would like to bring that to Anchor Bay. Thank you. Mr. Jankowski, we appreciate your interest in the superintendent position for Anchor Bay Schools. Uh, the board's interviewing five candidates, um, you being the fifth tonight and this week, and we will let you know tomorrow night where you stand in our search process. And thank you for your participation. Okay, thank you. And I'd, I'd like to leave you with my uh, entry plan if that's okay. Yes, you're welcome to yes and no. Okay. I know we were going to get an we're going to get an update from Mr. Silveri, our consultant. While um, while they are exiting, we let's go ahead and do our open forum. Um, I don't believe that we have anybody in house to speak, uh, Mr. Sizemore. If you could let me know if there's anybody virtually. No, there's not. Okay, then we will move on. <laughs> uh, Mr. Silveri is just dismissing our candidate, and then he's going to return and kind of lay out the next steps uh, for tomorrow, as well as next week in our candidate search. Madam President, the only thing I want to make sure that he does cover uh, is the submission virtually. I believe the virtual uh, feedback form is going to be up till about noon tomorrow. Um, and the board meets at 5.30 and uh, we will discuss a selection of uh, candidates to move on to the next round. All right, well, okay, didn't take this off. Since so I have the splash guard. Um, so you already made uh, your first difficult decision in this process, really, um, when you had to make a determination as to which of your 23 applicants would uh, participate in the interviews. And um, I think you did quite well. Um, you ended up having five people who are experienced, successful, accomplished, um, but, now you have to make another decision and it's another important one and it could be a tough one where you want to look to uh, who's going to advance in the process so now that you've had a chance to to meet them all and and interact with them a bit and learn more about them um, you need to determine um, which uh, which of the of the five uh, hopefully two that you're going to be able to narrow it down to are most likely to be highly successful in this role, most closely fit the profile, and who you will take this next step with and learn even more about now in order to help you ultimately choose one. So of the five, which are those two that you think are, are closest to 
um, being that person that you need. And uh, we'll advance those two in the process. And so I'll share, um, my job is really to advise to you, not dictate and tell you exactly what you're going to do. So I'll tell you what I would advise in terms of what we do tomorrow. We've done this um, in many other districts with success. Uh, so the suggestion would be, as we come back together, each of you take um, a, a whatever time you need to express what your view is of those five um, individuals who are the two that you would like to advance in the process. To whatever extent you would like to, you can speak to why. What I would urge you to do is just be um, careful to stay in an affirmative lane that you're going to speak to why in a positive way. What is it about these candidates that, that uh, you like? that you are um, impressed by, whatever the case might be, and why it is you may want to advance them and to avoid in any way, shape, or form being critical of any of the candidates and speaking to why not in terms of any of them. So you'll name hopefully two, and I'll answer the question now, sometimes it comes up, does it have to be two? Two is ideal. Does it absolutely have to be? It doesn't. If you somehow feel compelled to advance three, you could do that. If you felt that there really was only one that you had interest in, could you do that? You could, although I advise against that. Um, I've seen it happen many times that you can come out of the first round, pick two finalists, and the board may be heavily leaning one way after round one, but you're gonna learn more about these people in the second round, and you don't wanna narrow it too much, in my opinion. So um, two is ideal, and hopefully you could get to that, right? Um, so once each of you has had the chance, each of the seven of you to express, here are the two that I'm interested in advancing and here's why. What I'll be doing is keeping a tally. This is much like we did when we picked the five people to interview. I'll kind of give that back to you and let you know what the numbers look like, how many of you supported each of the candidates that was named. What typically happens, if we're lucky, there'll be a clear consensus that emerges where four or more of you have supported two of the candidates. And then it would just take somebody making a motion to advance those two. You, of course, still could have additional discussion. And if you end up on the short end, if you supported somebody, for example, who is not part of the motion um, and didn't have consensus in that initial discussion, you certainly could still speak to, look, I'd like to speak a little bit more about why I support that candidate. And hopefully some of you may reconsider. You can certainly have that level of dialogue. But once you have discussion on the motion, you take a vote. And if it's successful, you will have chosen your two candidates. And um, at that point, whatever happens, and if not, of course, it would take a second motion. We would keep going until we do have a successful one. Then we'll talk about what's coming next. And it's coming, it's coming in hot, right? It's coming fast. We're coming right back at it on Monday and Tuesday. I've already been working with your folks, and Sherry and Anita have been tremendously helpful, you should know. Um, but as we all realize, my gosh, we've got, starting on Monday, meetings with stakeholders during the day that precede even the interviews with the board. So we've already been in the process of getting those scheduled. And I think we finally ironed out a schedule today where the candidates would be coming in and starting at one o'clock. Um, they would meet with students first, then with administrators, and then with staff members, and then with parents and community members. It's the only group that will be limited or it won't be open to all members of that group would be students. It's not gonna be open to the whole student body. So we typically defer to, this, to the principal to sometimes they select the student council. Sometimes they say um, there's a civics or a government class where that might be appropriate, whatever the case might be, we'll let, leave that up to the principal's discretion. But otherwise any administrator who would like to attend during their time are, are welcome to. Any staff member who would like to attend at that time is welcome to. Same with parents and community members. We um, we talked about this before. We ask that you not be present so that they can be free to ask any questions that they may want, but I will be strongly urging them to follow up and provide feedback through the link that we're providing for that purpose. Um, that'll be made available to you so you'll have another kind of a treasure trove of feedback from your stakeholders for you to consider as you're starting to think about how you're going to narrow the focus down now um, between your two finalists and ultimately which one you're going to select. So there's a, a kind of a dinner and a rest break built in from about 530 to seven o'clock. And then the candidate comes back, meets with you, 
and has a follow-up interview. Um, there are times in the, the follow-up interview, and it's district discretion, where boards have asked that the candidates do a presentation of some sort too. In your case, that might be tough to pull off. I'll still let you make that choice, but bear in mind, I won't be informing these candidates until tomorrow night. Um, whether or not they've advanced. And I will be calling all five of them after the meeting tomorrow. Um, but for two of them, I'll be informing them that they're coming back, one of them coming back as soon as Monday and jumping right into it as soon as one o'clock on Monday. So it doesn't give them a whole heck of a lot of time to prepare a presentation. It might be a little bit short notice for that. If you feel strongly enough about it, we can still ask them to do so. Um, but otherwise, the second interview typically is 60 minutes not quite as many questions. Um, and we'll talk about that and how we're going to identify the interview questions a little bit more tomorrow night after you make your decision. So that's a lot of info. Who has questions about any of that? I don't believe in a presentation. Okay. That sounds like your date's going to start at 1 p.m. Yes. And then we're going to be judging them again in the second interview five hours later after three groups have already had this one. Four. I, I personally don't believe in a presentation by the career. Okay. okay. That's just my opinion. Appreciate that. I would agree with you. Yeah, I'm on board as well. Fine with me as well. Okay. It, it is, it's certainly, it's, it's, uh, every board is different, right? It, it's not, it's not a typical part of what we do in the second round, but it, pardon? I would tend to agree. It, you might want to more strongly consider it if there was more time, but it's, it's very short notice. So, um, oh, sure. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I'll just end with that. That's, that's a lot that you have now to consider. And you were smart enough to walk away from this after tonight, give yourself a little bit more time to process this, look at whatever feedback now has come in from tonight from your stakeholders who watched the interviews too, which is important for you to consider who watched the interview tonight. Um, so you've got the application that you initially received, cover letter, resume, you can go back through those again. You've got additional materials that the candidates presented you with. You've got your own interview notes. You're going to have feedback too from your stakeholders. That's a lot of data to consider. As again, you kind of compare and contrast and decide which of the two do you think are um, thus far have proven to be the best fit for Anchor Bay and, and best prepared to be highly successful for you. So um, we'll jump back into it at 5.30 tomorrow. Again, ask each of you to kind of weigh in and, and we'll go from there. Anyone have any further questions? All right. I guess I'd just ask what, when is this, the site visits? Is that already set up? The following up? week. We had said the week of May yeah, 3rd. But I, so, oh. it's, yes, so we'll talk about that uh, after you make your decision tomorrow. We're gonna really wanna talk about all remaining steps in the process, um, including site visits. So we'll get into that some more tomorrow, but that would, it's, it's, it should be taking place a week after next. And we'll talk about um, okay. how we'll go about setting that up and how you would select dates and get into the details of it. One last thing that I almost forgot, um, I, what I typically do, um, I mentioned to you before that um, until you select candidates to interview, I'm not doing formal reference checks due to confidentiality, but I'm doing background checks in other ways. So I have started doing formal um, reference checks just this week. And it's preliminary initially, um, so I at least make some inroads and make sure I've made some contact with each of the candidates. Um, I'm going to be sending you, I wanted you to get through the interviews first, just a really brief summary tonight by email. So be looking to, uh, for an email. Um, and there's not a lot to share, but, but enough that I think it's just one more little bit of information for you to consider. Once you pick two finalists, I do a much deeper dive with references at that point. And ultimately, we'll be providing you with a summary of that as well.
I promise to stop now. I keep adding things when I say I'm done. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much. All right, thank you. And so at this point, like we said, um, tomorrow night, we will reconvene at 5.30 and um, we will decide on our second round you know, candidates that will also, like Mr. Silveri said, um, likely Monday, Tuesday, uh, we'll be meeting with stakeholders, one candidate each day, and then followed up by a seven o'clock meeting with the board. Um, so just kind of looking, looking ahead towards those, um, those items. Okay. And I can take, other than that, a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mr. Drew. Support. Seconded by... Mr. Green, please call the roll. <laughs> uh, Madam President. Yes. Green is yes. Mr. Daru. Yes. Uh, Ms. Knox. Yes. And Mr. Richards. Yes. All right. Meeting is adjourned at 724. Uh, everybody have a good evening and we'll be back tomorrow.